Rebecca, I'm delighted to see that you have tuned in early, even though it's three hours earlier in California. Um, would you be willing to start early and um, introduce yourself? I unfortunately don't have right in front of me your bio biographical information, so please um, take over and I've made you co-host so you can do your presentation just the way Lee did. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so surprised to be invited to present and pleased uh, and honored to be with Lee, such a um, big figure in our, in our world. Uh, my name's Rebecca Shenalu. That's a Turkish name. My husband is Turkish. Uh, another, uh, he grew up in a village where people actually cared for their own dead. So I'm married to someone who's also familiar with this practice. Um, I'm the cancer of many things. I'm a community minister. I'm an ordained minister. I um, have been for 20 years. Uh, I've uh, done a lot of funerals and weddings. Um, my regular paycheck comes as a cancer support program coordinator at our uh, community hospital here, Enlo Community Hospital, where um, I coordinate programs for support. But I got into that job um, as a hospice spiritual support volunteer. And um, I also have a unit of clinical pastoral education from UC Davis uh, because I thought I was going to be a chaplain and then found this perfect little place for myself at the local cancer center. And um, <laughs> I uh, have been a home funeral guide since I think 2013. I, I'm trying to remember, Lee, when that um, conference was in Chicago. It was almost 10 years ago, I think. And uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, let's see here. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So <clears throat> I think going from one presentation to another, it's always a good idea to just sort of take a breath, assimilate what we've taken in and um, engage yourself for the next round. I'm kind of glad I'm going second instead of last, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, so <clears throat> let's see here. So today I'm going to be talking about a simulated home funeral activity that I created based on a longer three-day exercise that Jerry Grace Lyons teaches in her Final Passages Level 3 Home Funeral Guide training. And um, I'm going to talk about why I think it's a, important to do this activity. I'm going to talk about different venues where you can do it, uh, the details of how you do it. I'm going to share some experiences that I've, you know, of what people have shared with me after doing it. And I'm going to close with the death ed story of David Sisk. Um, before I dive in, I will share just a word about my home funeral, and um, and so I do have a funeral, of, a, a, a picture of dead people, a dead person. This is Fred and Ilona, and uh, it's a long, beautiful story that I don't have time to go into, but the gist of it is that it was at this home funeral that I watched how differently Fred was able to process this death because of the presence of Ilona's body and the opportunity to be with her over the course of three days. I mean, the first evening, it, he just couldn't believe she was dead. And he just kept going up and looking at her really closely to see if she was still breathing. And um, this is the bed that they had shared for so many years. And he actually, and I'm sharing this because I'm with a bunch of funeral people. I wouldn't share these kind of details or necessarily this photo in my first, you know, if I was talking to a, um, a completely uh, new crowd, but I'm trusting you guys with this. Um, to let you know that he, he actually slept next to her the first night. And this is not the only time that I've heard this happen. And uh, so um, then the second day, the house was full of family and food and decorating the cardboard casket. 
Um, most people would slip in at some time to be with Ilona. She had been a very passionate lover of bird song. And so there was a CD of bird songs playing in the room. And it was so peaceful in there. And her grandsons, who I think were in like fourth grade and sixth grade, um, and, and their mother, her daughter, was very conservative and very hesitant about this. So they were from a different sort of mindset than Alona and Fred. Um, but those grandsons moved comfortably in between um, the rooms. And I think they learned that death doesn't have to be scary. Um, and their mom did too. And then by the third day, Fred was saying things like, she's not here anymore. And um, what do we do now? And he had processed that what was left was a beautiful shell, but she wasn't there anymore. And so they placed her in the cardboard casket that had been beautifully covered with Mary Oliver poems and bird feathers and cut out pictures of basketballs from the grandsons and put her in her beloved camper van and drove her to the crematorium. And then they went out and ate blueberry pancakes in her honor. And so this was my first home funeral. And uh, I'd like to get to know my audience a little bit. I'm not sure how many of you, and I'm just gonna make my, um, my picture here a little bit bigger so that I can hopefully see you better. How many of you have attended a home funeral already? Can you hold up your hand? wave it a little bit in your, your picture. There's one, two, um, yeah. So a couple, but um, not a lot. And this is actually why I think the simulated home funeral activity is so helpful is because not that many people have had the opportunity to actually participate in a home funeral. And I really, really want more people to get the experience of being with a body at the time of death and thinking about what that would be like to have um, the opportunity to honor the body in this way and to say goodbye. So, and, and even if we would never consider doing a home funeral, um, the activity gives us an opportunity to notice some of our deeply rooted reactions to being around death. And as you'll hear in the presentation, the, simulate, the simulated home funeral also allows people to say and do things that they didn't get to do when their loved one died. So those are some of the whys I, I choose to do this activity. You know, Lee, seeing you, I was really thinking about language and messaging. The name of this activity was originally the mock home funeral. And I decided that mock home funeral is not, uh, it sounds too close to mocking. So we had to get rid of mock, but simulated is not that great either. Rehearsal, enactment. Lee, I invite you to put your thinking cap on about this activity as we go through it. And you can email me and let me know what name you think would be good for it. So before I explain the details of the activity, I'd like to give you a little context about where I've done this activity. My friend Malama McNeil and I wanted to pull together people in our small community. Chico is a little college town in the North state of California, very different than what people normally think of when they think of California and palm trees. I live up um, close to the mountains at the top of the valley. And, um, and we wanted to, you know, create an alliance of people who were working on various aspects of bringing death out of the closet and, and uh, to provide, you know, joined efforts in education. And we called it the Alliance for Support and Education in Dying and Death, which ended up being a really long name. That, and that was Malama's idea, Lee. That was not my idea. Um, <laughs> really long name uh, that got shortened to all said. And we never wanted to deal with running an organization or having to fundraise. So we never formalized it with a 401c3, never had a bank account, but we did a lot. We did these uh, five different befriending death workshops, which were long all day, you know, I mean like four, four to six hour things, even longer. Um, we had regular Memorial Day cemetery walks of remembrance. We had a lot of death cafes. You probably know what that is. And for three years, we did monthly presentations at our public library on topics like green burial and voluntary stopping of eating and drinking and home funerals and filling out advanced directives and all that kind of stuff.
but most beloved to us were the befriending death events that always took place around Day of the Dead. And uh, two years we did these events at art galleries, which was a very non-confrontational place to hold death events. And then uh, two years we did it at the Chico Women's Club, which is a beautiful venue, a place built by Annie Bidwell, the wife of the founder of our town. And uh, at one, the second one of these events was one of the biggest ones that we did. And we closed with a dance party with a band and had a bar. And that was really fun. <laughs> and, um, and then the last time I did this activity, we were at the Chico Public Library community room where we'd been holding our monthly presentations and we just adjusted the activity to fit into an evening event. And you can just see in this photo, the two massage tables waiting to be moved into the center of the room after the initial presentation. And um, uh, so this gives you a little context for the where. I'm not going to talk too much about all set events um, right now, but uh, I invite you to ask me any questions that interest you about uh, the different things we did in the Q&A. So this presentation is specifically about the simulated home funeral activity. And you can do the activity with one or two tables, or you can set it up like this with four tables. And in this case, we did two rounds. So we accommodated close to 50 people through this activity um, at, in, this, in this case. The activity takes about an hour, although if the groups are only three people, it could be shorter. I have a materials list and an instruction list for this activity that will be available to you by email. So don't feel like you have to write everything down as we go along. But I wanted you to see a simple list of the sort of things you need to have available um, as I go over the setup with you uh, while we're looking at this photo. So um, in addition to what you see here, there were also chairs available if people felt like they needed to sit down. But um, you'll see in the middle of the picture, a table of items for dressing and decorating. These are various shawls, fabrics, silk flowers, jewelry, large clothes. Um, and then in the back corner, you can just see a table of sacred items like candles and crosses and Buddhas and feathers and rocks and shells and essential oils. And then under each massage table, there's a large bowl. It has a Ziploc bag with four washcloths in it and a towel. It has an instruction sheet and a, and a page of uh, sticky name tag labels that indicate different roles that people might play. And there's a bell or a Ting Sha. And um, I begin when everybody's in a large group and I begin with an intro that goes kind of like this. So you can pretend you're in the room with me as I'm, as I'm beginning to introduce the activity. And I say, in this activity, we're going to enact a home funeral so that we might experience some of what moves us and what challenges us at the prospect of being present at the time of death and caring for our own dead. The simulation will be general in that you will choose a role or relationship that you might imagine having with the deceased. And then you'll be pretending rather than actually having to do any real death care. Um, but performing these simplified actions might bring up strong feelings, and we encourage you to notice and honor that. Like children pre pretending our way through stories that we've yet to experience, rehearsing a death can give us some idea of how we might want to act when we are faced with the real thing. <clears throat> Oops. Yeah. So I begin. Um, <clears throat> what's happening here? Let's see. Sorry, it was slow to pull up, and then I clicked twice. Okay. So I explained that each massage table will represent a different home funeral, and although we encourage participation, it's okay to simply sit, witness, or to wait and see how you feel about it. The person who will die should be comfortable having shoes and socks removed, being touched and rolled from side to side, and should be able to lie comfortably and act lifeless for up to 30 minutes. And the deceased should also indicate to their group if they don't want essential oils in the water. So once you've got your rolls and your deceased is on the table, um, one of you will read through the second section of instructions and begin the role play section of the exercise. And 
do your best to stay in character. You'll be referring to each other in your roles as mom or sister or dad or brother or lover. And as those loved ones, you'll be working out who will do what. Um, there's a list of actions that we suggest you incorporate, but how you choose to do it is entirely up to you. Uh, check in with each other. Be sure that everyone feels as included as they want to be. And also honor when someone has decided they don't want to do a certain action. Let this unfold organically. Uh, improvise your roles and interact with others. I'll be walking around and making sure that everyone is okay and helping keep things on track, answering any questions that need to be asked. And then when the role play is over, you'll ring a bell to bring the person back to life. And there are some queries on the instructions to guide you in discussing in the group what came up for you. Take some notes on your program card. And this is a trick I do for every death education event that I hold. When we have a little program that has links that might be helpful or the names of the presenters, on the back, there's always a couple of simple questions where people can jot down some thoughts that, or ideas that they had. And I tell people at the beginning of any, at any of our events, if you just write down a few notes on this paper today and go home and stick it in a folder, by the end of the times you're coming to these programs, you'll have a little folder with some notes to give your loved ones some guidance, you know, things that they might not think to write on an advanced directive, but that will be helpful come up in these programs. And so I always want them to write those things down. So write some notes on your program card to remind you of insights gained or challenges experienced. And, um, and then I have them count off and they go to their individual tables. Each group gets a printed guide and a page of possible roles, name tags that they might play. The preparation stage takes about 10 or 15 minutes as someone reads the instructions and they decide who's going to be the dead person and each person gets their name tag on. And as you can see, there's a wild card on the name tag. So people are really free to be whoever they want to be in this. The actual enactment takes about 30 minutes and consists of these elements, ringing the bell to signify taking the last breath, washing the body, preparing the body, and saying goodbye. So after they read this section of the instruction, someone rings the bell and someone goes and fills the bowl with water and adds a few drops of essential oils if they all agree that's a good idea. Others remove jackets or their shawls, shoes, socks, any excess clothing. And each person who wishes to help wash takes a washcloth and gently begins to assist washing the body. As the body is being washed, each person is imagining it to be the body of someone they love and that they're saying goodbye. And it's also okay to simply hold space, to hum, to pray silently, whatever one feels led to do. And when the washing and drying is finished, someone empties and dries the bowl. Others put the wet washcloths back in the Ziploc bag. And I find that just like with a real home funeral, tasks are negotiated naturally, tenderly, and generously. The next step is preparing the body for lying in grace. And Items from the ceremony tables are used to dress, decorate, or drape the body. Someone can comb and arrange the hair. I have little baggies of combs and clips and, and things for the hair. It's really always so beautiful to see how people improvise with what they have, which is what you do with a home funeral too. I'm always impressed by how realistic these activities become. The room very quickly becomes focused and hushed as people step into their roles and the tasks at hand. The last step is saying goodbye. And when the body preparations are complete, the group circles around the body and each person has an opportunity to express their farewell. This can be silent. It can be in the form of a kiss or a song. It can be a ritual action like lighting a candle 
or saying a prayer, ringing a bell. It's okay to pass. When everyone has said goodbye, there's usually a little ceremonial silence. And then some, everyone looks at each other and someone rings the bell to end the exercise. The third section of instructions guides in the debriefing of the exercise and it's called waking the dead and processing the exercise. And it normally takes 10 or 15 minutes depending on how many people are in each group. And I wanna mention that it can be intense to come back to life after this exercise. So the group is instructed to very gently welcome the person who was dead back to the world of the living. And everyone removes their name tags, returns any items to the ceremony table, and then they discuss how the exercise went. And we offer a few queries to get them started. Uh, like, um, I was most surprised by feeling this or that. And uh, this exercise changed my understanding of death because. As you can imagine, the responses to this activity are wide ranging. I'll never forget this woman's reaction. She said when she shared to the group that she was combing the hair of the deceased and she was suddenly struck by thoughts of her lover and that he was alive and that she could be spending her time with him appreciating simple and tender acts like combing his hair instead of bickering with him. They'd been going through a rough patch and she felt so grateful that she had this realization that she started crying and she just couldn't stop not from sadness, but out of appreciation for her new awareness. So the activity provides these kinds of realizations about living, not just about dying. Getting to play the deceased person is a special gift. I have played that role and to be the recipient of so much love and tenderness from strangers is overwhelming. It doesn't feel like pretend love. When someone is pouring out their heart, it feels like real love. And when the bell rings and you come back to life and open your eyes, everything seems shiny and you feel lucky to be alive after being dead. So that's a special uh, thing that comes out of these activities. As you would expect, there are different levels of comfort with all of this. You can see in this photo, the person with her hands in her pockets and the man standing back while the other woman is looking to him. For some people, this exercise can really put into sharp focus how uncomfortable they are around death, how they don't know what they would do, how they don't know what they would say. And I think that's a very valuable thing to realize. I know that a home funeral is not for everyone. I certainly appreciate our two family-owned you know, funeral homes in our town and what they offer. Um, I just want people to be thinking about what works for them and to get their wishes in writing, which is also always a part of these befriending death events. One woman shared how things had not gone well when her mother died. I can't tell you how many people are driven to our events by bad experiences and wanting it to, do, to be better next time, wanting it to be better when they die. Even though she was with her mother at the time of death, she had not been able to say what she needed to say because there was discord between the sisters. There was not a plan for what would happen. And when mom took her last breath, I mean, things really just went south. So in the home funeral activity, she found herself taking care of the body and having the opportunity to say the things she didn't get to say to her mom. And I've had more than one participant say they experienced the same thing, a kind of healing and peace because they used the opportunity to say what they didn't get to say, or maybe just weren't able, you know, weren't together enough, weren't, didn't have enough presence of mind to say when their loved one had really died. So, 
like Lee said, I mostly have no way of knowing how these activities affect people or um, how they actually handle being with death or doing after death care beyond this activity. But at the befriending death event in 2015, a woman named Beth Sisk did the simulated home funeral exercise. And I do know how that turned out. And so in closing, I'm going to be sharing the death ed a death education story of David Sisk. Let me give you some background. Beth's husband, David, was a beloved figure in Chico. He was an artist and a sign maker. And he would, in addition to making regular signs, like the sign for the Quaker Friends Meeting House where I go, where I worship, um, he would create these whimsical billboards with Cisco wisdoms that made him very well known. So it was a shock on a Sunday last spring when he was walking his dog in our upper park and had a heart attack. It was a beautiful spring day. There were a lot of people in the park and David was up on a ridge. So it wasn't that easy to get to him. And by the time they made it down with the body, a deputy from the coroner's office was there. A chaplain from the sheriff's office was there. Beth was there. And my friend Adrian, who also happens to be a home funeral guide and is a friend of Beth's was in the midst of all this shock and activity. Now, Beth knew because of the befriending death workshop that she wanted to bring David home. Um, but because this was a coroner's case, it was an unexpected death, um, they wouldn't release the body directly to the family. And David was taken to the local funeral home uh, and put in cold storage until Monday, this was a Sunday, when the body was then released to the family. And not only was this a great educational moment for home funerals um, for uh, you know, all of the family and friends, but it also showed people, including the coroner's office and the funeral home, that someone can die in a hospital or unexpectedly in Upper Park, be taken to the morgue, and you can still have a home funeral. I asked Beth to record the next part of the story so that you can hear it in her own words. Um, the, the recording, uh, her part of the story that I cut begins when uh, David's body came home on Monday. It's about a five minute recording. And I apologize, there is some clicking, a ticking sound in the middle section because Beth started clicking something when she was talking, but it goes away pretty quickly. So um, don't worry about that. If, you know, if the volume on this is weird, um, Tony, I'm going to be looking at you, and if you could just wave your hand or something, if you know, give me it needs to be louder or it's okay, because I'm going to play this uh, through my computer, and I hope the volume is good. My family, including my granddaughter, my children, a few friends, we all went ahead with our own ritual about receiving his body and having music playing and everybody contributed in washing his body and taking his shoes and other things off and washing his body and dressing him and clothes it. He wore a lot, his little hat. And um, yeah, we just made a beautiful altar in the living room. And um, our friend Adrian helped us with the process of, you know, we had to get a cot together. She came and helped with the dry ice and we, you know, set it up so that his body could be maintained while he was in, at, in home. You know, um, my kids just seemed like they were just in the flow of it. I don't think it, they knew something like was happened, but I think their own instinct was because I think it was so shocking to all of us um, that I just think they could have stood the idea of his body being taken away. Even that 24 hours he was gone was disturbing to them. You know, so uh, they were into his body coming back. And so I, without my kids or my granddaughter having a whole lot of prep for that, they just fell in line, you know. And, uh, yeah, it was really beautiful, the participation. And then we did have some close friends and family come over either that night, I think it was that night, maybe it was the next night, 
So people came in and sat in the room. For many people, that was probably the first time they sat in the room with the dead body. So I think it was very instructive for everybody and took them beyond their concepts about how they think they would have felt. And because they were all people that were really close to my husband, it's, maybe on some level that seemed more natural to do that. And things change from day to day. I think at first, especially when I saw David's body coming down the hill, I couldn't relate to that very well then. I think I was still kind of in shock, but also it was like that feeling of like, he's not here, you know, my own resistance to the fact that he had left and not relating to the body as well then, even though I did, but it was, it changed over the days that David's body was here, different looks on his face. It's almost like maybe there was still some of the trauma from the CPR, you know, that I felt when I first saw his body in the park. But it was back in the house, and when we washed him and then dressed him and done all this stuff, it was, like, really sweet. I think it just looked, it looked really natural and even had a little smirk on his face to look like sometimes. And at one point, my daughter said, and this was after a couple of days, she said, Mom, hold um, hold Dad's hand. His hand has softened, and we're not so cold. And there was, yeah, so that was sweet. There were moments. And at one moment, I looked in the living room, and there was my granddaughter with her head on David's chest. And I think that was really important, her saying goodbye to him. So I was really amazed, not so much with my kid, but with my granddaughter, who's a teenager, who just really flowed with this whole thing and did beautiful decorations on the cardboard box. And, you know, people came and, and sat outside and sang songs and decorated. And even we did it into the night. We had lights outside and... People were still decorating the box until late at night. Anyway, that was, it was, the whole process was very sweet. And I feel like it was important. I think important for everybody to have some time to come to terms with the death, that whole phrase of befriending death. I feel like, uh, that was the practice for everybody of befriending death. And, uh, yeah, being present. Feeling, expressing on the on the cardboard coffin, and it was really powerful for all of us. And I think made it a lot easier. By the time the last day, we took uh, David's body out of the house, and inside the cardboard box was just layered with flowers. And my friend who did the ceremony with us put her kind of eagle feather and condor feather in and someone else put all these herbs in. And uh, it was just really beautiful, the blessing uh, of David and his body before it, they came and took it to uh, the funeral home. Even though this is out of the ordinary for most people and beyond their, uh, their experience, I just saw how helpful it was to everybody and how beauty could be created and how much love could be shared in the process of of accepting the passing of my husband. So what I've come to accept <laughs> is that the death of David Sisk probably did more to educate our community about home funerals than all my programs in the 10 years preceding his death. <laughs> but I take some comfort in knowing that it was one of our programs and specifically the simulated home funeral activity that planted the seed for all of this. So we never know, you know, what, what good will come of, what, of our education efforts. In closing, I just have to add one more fact, fun fact about our befriending death events. People would often bring bottles of spirits to put on the Dia de los Muertos altar, particularly tequila. So um, after four to six hours of creating and ritualizing and processing, um, we would celebrate the end of the day with tequila shots. And you could just feel the joy of living, which goes to show you that bringing death out of the closet doesn't need to be a somber affair, but can really become a, a celebration. Uh, and we always made it a, a celebration. Thank you.
that's, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open up to gallery so I can see you guys a little bit better. Rebecca, thank you so much. This has been an, another wonderful presentation. Um, we have a little time now for um, questions or um, statements that people would like to make. And I'm happy to say that Misha Pride has been able to join us after some technical difficulties and he is ready to go after we finish any questions or comments to Rebecca. Um, use the um, chat function if you would like, and Sarah, keep your eye on that since I'm also communicating with um, others at the same time. Karen, did you want to ask your question or it was in the chat oh, earlier? It, uh, it, I just noticed that at the very beginning of your presentation, Rebecca, that um, I think her name was Alona. I, I assume that they had already done body washing and, and dressing her because she's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, she, um, her daughter was not interested. Um, her daughter was appalled that her mother wanted to be uh, taken to the crematorium in the old camper van. Mom, you're not going to go in that old camper van. And Alona saying, I will go in the camper van. And, and uh, so the daughter was not involved, but Fred's daughters, Alona's stepdaughters, um, and Fred did the body washing, yes. Any other comments or questions for Rebecca? I wonder what sort of activities um, you guys have in Maine or that your organization has. I'm not very familiar with this scene in Maine. It's a long ways away from here. So maybe you can tell me if, if this seems like something that would translate. During COVID, it's not going to be a great activity. I realized that after the fact. But um, yeah, what, what do you guys think in terms of opportunities? Or do you think this is something that would be too far out? Is this a California? Uh, some, sometimes I need a reality check. I've participated in a few workshops like this. So yes, I can't remember who sponsored them. But and I'm also part of a group in the Belfast area that is a mid coast area that is has in fact spent the last few years supporting each other and talking to each other. Unfortunately, a few of the members now, there's been two deaths, but one of the most recent deaths happened during COVID, not because of COVID. And the widow has not been vaccinated. So I don't know that our group is going to be able to get together soon because that's a, a real sadness that some of us are vaccinated and some of us are not. But that's, you know, that's the politics of it. I fully intend and I'm very excited about recreating what you've done there here. And I'm working on it and hope to implement it soon and am super excited and think it will be very well received. And thank you for all your help and information and support. I appreciate it.